Now you probably know that I'm a big proponent of the Blackmagic cinema cameras on this channel because they get so much bang for your buck. But what if I told you there might be another camera out there that might trump those for the price? And I'm talking about a small little camera that's full frame and can shoot 12-bit raw 4K video. And for only $1,500. Now I've already reviewed this camera once in the past, but since then I think it's been well over a year since the camera came out and they keep updating the camera. It keeps getting better and better and it still has a lot of flaws that we'll sort of talk about in this video, but mostly I wanna talk about the image quality from this camera and what you can get out of this camera for its small form factor and price. Okay, I'm not gonna leave you hanging any longer here. We're talking about the Sigma FP. And actually, if you want to spend just a hundred extra dollars, you can get this 45 millimeter f2.8 lens with it, full frame raw in this tiny little package. So what intrigued me about this camera was obviously what I just talked about, the size specs ratio here. I like to really look at cameras and see like, okay, so this isn't a great run and gun camera. Does it have internal NDs? Does it have amazing autofocus? Does it have great battery life? But what it has is a really nice image quality that is super flexible and post because of that 12-bit RAW, and it doesn't cost very much money. It's cheaper than a Pocket 6K or definitely cheaper than a Pocket 6K Pro. It's cheaper than a Sony FX3. But what actually intrigued me about this camera was the usability potential of it. So you guys already know that I have a red Komodo. I have that thing fully rigged up most scenarios for my commercial gigs and whatnot. And it's a full cinema package. But what if I want a little B camera that I can bop around with and get really high quality video with in a really small form factor? So Sigma also released this like EVF that you can put onto the side of the camera, which I don't remember if this was available when I reviewed the camera the first time, but I definitely did not get it in my review kit. So if we just put that on, it has a USB and an HDMI on it, and you can basically, you just mount it on here and you just spin it, spin this little knob, and then it locks into place on the camera. And now you have a viewfinder, so you can just bop around with this little thing and shoot a uh, 4K RAW. So in order to shoot proper 4K RAW, and it's shooting in the cinema DNG format, which basically means it's shooting like a full res photo for every frame, so 24 frames per second, 24 photos a second that are raw. So there's no compression at all, so it's gonna shoot two gigabytes per second. You can do some math there. You're going to eat up a card really fast. So what I thought 
would be a fun little way of doing this and shooting with this in the small form factor like this is to take a small hard drive. You can take like something like a T7 drive or like maybe like a little SanDisk drive. And I put a little Velcro piece on the bottom here and then you can simply take your hard drive and just mount it on the bottom like so. And then on the side of the EVF, they have an SSD, you know, USB-C port at the side. It gives you that functionality back and you can plug that in and then you can just put your SSD on the bottom like that and then walk around shooting full frame raw into this tiny little package with the EVF. If you're a filmmaker, cinematographer, photographer, or anything really, you're probably gonna need a place to put your work online. And that's where Squarespace comes in. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to present your work online. Now, I've been using Squarespace for a better part of a decade now, and I've always loved it because it makes it super easy to quickly customize my website on the fly. Obviously, you can embed videos on there, upload photos, create contact forms. The options are really endless. So if you're anything like me and you need to present your work online, well, you can just do that with Squarespace. Click the link in the description to get 10% off, and I want to thank Squarespace for sponsoring this video. So originally when I reviewed this camera, there was quite a few things I didn't like about it. I mean, it just seemed kind of incomplete, you know? The thing that most bugged me about it was that it didn't really have a flat log profile. They have since then added a flat profile. I don't know if I would really call it log. I could be wrong on this, but it doesn't seem as flat as other profiles, but at least you could, you know, if you wanted to use the micro HDMI port, you could send out a signal from this into a monitor or something like that if you wanted to, to view a log image and put a lot on there, but also has a bunch of color modes already built into it, a lot of color profiles that you can view your image on top of of, and when you are using RAW, you can just bring it into your computer, flip it over to Blackmagic Log inside of like DaVinci Resolve, and then you can get your log profile back and you can color it however you want. But you're not gonna see that Blackmagic Log right in the camera. You're gonna have to use their own version of a flat profile to see that, which you don't have the ability to see again once you get it into something like Resolve. Um, so there's just like a, some quirks, you know, this camera has some quirks, but for $1,500, you're getting so much image for the cost. I mean, Pretty much anything in the market right now that you might be looking for from a cinema camera standpoint is going to cost more than $1,500. This one also has dual native ISO, has 3200 ISO as your second native, and then 100 is the base, which let's talk about that for a second. 100 ISO is a kind of a weird place to put your dynamic range. What that means basically is that everything is in the bottom of the spectrum. So the highlights tend to clip really fast. That's why most cameras have more of like an 800 native ISO. Um, Cause it's just gonna give you a better latitude overall from shadows to brightness. So when I say this camera has really high image quality, it does, it's probably getting around 12 stops of dynamic range, but it doesn't really feel like that. It, the highlights clip so fast, but you are getting that 12-bit raw, so you have a lot of flexibility in post with this camera. So you can do what I did with this camera. I just walked around and shot like this, you know, just a really small handheld, high quality setup, something that I could probably pair with my Red Komodo if I wanted to. Or you can, you know, go the other route and maybe you don't have a lot of money to spend on a cinema camera, but really all you care about is image quality and you don't care about, you know, ND filters and small file sizes and stuff like that. In that case, you could shoot rig this up like any other cinema camera, put a cage on it, put a monitor on it, put a dummy battery into it and power it all separately. Or you could go to the small form factor. The batteries last maybe probably over an hour, maybe probably even more if you weren't shooting with it too continuously um, internally. Uh, but I would definitely recommend getting a separate battery pack if you wanted to use it as a proper cinema camera. But really that's what we're talking about today. We're not really talking about it being rigged up. So this is basically the smallest you can go. Technically you go smaller, you could take off the hard drive and then you could shoot a full HD 12 bit internally to an SD card. If you're into that sort of thing, some people might care about their color more than the resolution. In that case, you could shoot full HD 1080p, or you also could shoot 10 bit raw, I believe on this camera, which I'm not sure how they're doing that, but that would give you the ability to probably shoot to an SD card. So let's turn it on and check it. What's also nice about this viewfinder is it has this switch on the side here. Basically you can go from LCD to EVF and that will switch it from this to this whenever you want, which really will save on battery if you're just using the EVF mode like this. You can shoot 60 frames per second, 12 bit full HD internally. This camera will do 120 frames per second, but you're gonna have to use one of their eight bit codecs that are built into the camera instead. It is strange, it doesn't have 10 bit codecs built into the camera, which would really make this camera a game changer 
for the cost, $1,500, if you could do 10-bit codecs internally onto an SD card, this would kind of trump everything on the market. And it does have autofocus. You can use one of these little like Sigma contemporary lenses. This is an L mount here. It does have autofocus, it does work. It actually has a stills mode too, so you could switch it into stills and shoot stills with it. But the autofocus so far for me has been pretty slow and not super fast. It doesn't hunt like other cameras do, so that might be a benefit to you. Um, but it does work really slow and doesn't seem extremely usable. So let's talk a little bit more about the dynamic range. That really was the thing that bummed me out about this camera. I thought the image quality was really nice. You know, it's pure raw basically, right? So you're getting everything you want off of a sensor and it's full frame 4K. But you do have to kind of deal with the highlight latitude. With doing a side-by-side -side test with my RED Komodo, I just found that it really did not hold highlights the same way. It just didn't look quite as pleasing overall. Something I did do in post that I, would probably recommend for other people too, would be to conform all your footage to Airy Log C and then grade it. What's kind of fun about the fact that this camera doesn't have its own kind of native log profile is that you can just conform that 12 bit into whatever log space you want later and then work with it in that way. So it's just a matter of kind of finding your own workflow with it. I do also think the built-in profiles to view things is kind of nice because you can view everything in like a teal orange cinematic kind of color. And then later when you get in post, you can do whatever you want with it, but at least you have a viewing option in camera to uh, view your footage while you're filming. Okay, so Spencer from the future here, I decided to do a quick more kind of dynamic range test, kind of a more proper test between the cameras. And I was right for sure, the Sigma FP does clip faster in the highlights but I found something interesting once you get it into post. Once you conform it to Airy Log C, and then you turn on highlight recovery, you get so much information back. It's actually pretty remarkable how much you get back. So I guess the only issue would be when you're actually filming, it's gonna be hard to expose for those highlights, but knowing later in post, you might be able to get a bunch of that latitude back. I also found that if you underexpose the Sigma FP a lot and try to save your highlights, you can bring back so much of the shadows in post as well because you're working with that full raw file. Something else I forgot to mention is that yes, you're shooting raw, but you cannot change your ISO later on the Cinema DNG files from the Sigma. You can do an exposure compensation, so just lift your exposure however you want, but you can't change your ISO later in post. You can only change your white balance and tint. Now they keep updating this camera uh, like pretty often. Actually, I think it was just like yesterday they updated it to where it now has like false color built into it. It has a lot of weird like streaming options. It can do a lot of weird quirky things, which makes it just pretty unique in this space. And once again, especially for the cost. So if you're someone that's kind of been looking at black magic cameras or you're trying to figure out what cinema camera to get next, but you really, the thing that's most important to you is just the image quality. Maybe look into these, the Sigma FP. You could buy two of these for still less than the cost of a Sony a7S III or an FX3. You could have two full frame raw cameras that you could walk around with like this and shoot high quality video. So when doing my testing with this camera, I adapted my Canon FD lenses to it. I primarily shot with the 55 millimeter F1.2. And then for a couple shots here too, I was you know hanging out with my artist friend, Matt Miller. He was the one that was uh, nice enough to stand in for me to get some shots. He uh, actually has the Canon TV 0.95 uh, dream lens. So we shot with that too. It's the same lens that they shot like Army of Dead on and wide open. It's completely blurry mess, but also it's sharp right in the center and just gives us a really nice soft texture to skin. Really fun thing to shoot with. So uh, a lot of these shots are also done with that lens. And that's what's cool about a mirrorless camera. Obviously it's L mount, so you can adapt anything you want to it. So if you wanted to keep it small and light like this, you could, or if you you wanted to build it out into a cinema camera, well, you can put a PL mount on this. You can put um, whatever kind of mount you want on this camera and build it up into something more usable for cinema use. So you could also kind of do a medium size, you know, package like this where you're running off the internal battery. And then I put the SSD on the back here. You could probably clean up these cables a little bit. These are just the cables that I had. Um, so I just kind of threw them on the rig like this, but I think I could do a better setup than that. And then you can kind of just walk around with a handle and a nice big monitor to see what you're doing here and view your image and have 12-bit raw kind of cinema rig. 
You know, a lot of people kind of shoot with Sony FX3s kind of in this same package, you know, with the Sony top handle and then a monitor on top and then just internal batteries, just buy a bunch of internal batteries and put, you know, a bigger battery on the monitor on the back here like this, or you could put two on here. And that would cost less than most mirrorless cinema camera rigs on the market today. And especially full frame ones that shoot 4K. So this is not a bad little setup either. So something else to note in this kind of form factor here is that you could also shoot with an Atomos Ninja 5 or a Blackmagic recorder and get B-RAW out of the HDMI port as well. So if you shot B-RAW, you'd be getting a Blackmagic RAW log image with compressed RAW so you wouldn't have to deal with such huge file sizes. So that's basically having a full frame pocket camera. Dual native ISO, full frame, Blackmagic RAW, it's the same at that point. I mean, you're probably gonna have a monitor on top of your rig anyway, so why not just get one that also records B-RAW? So I'm actually gonna keep the camera around for a few more weeks and do some lighting setups with it and kind of just see how it really would perform in a controlled environment like I like to do here on the channel. So subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more of that content. And I hope this kind of sheds some light on a camera that you might have forgotten about, but might still be an option to buy even right now in 2022. Now don't be confused with the Sigma FPL. That's another version of the camera that they came out with that I think is geared more towards stills photography than it is towards the video side of things because they put a basically a higher megapixel sensor in that and it costs more money, but it doesn't really give you anything extra in terms of video quality. So I definitely go for the $1,500 option, maybe even the $1,600 option that comes with the Sigma Contemporary 45 millimeter F 2.8, which is just a fun little autofocus lens that you can throw on the front of it for only $100. So Overall, I think the image quality is really nice coming out of this camera, mostly because of the flexibility of that 12-bit RAW. There are some things that I would change definitely about the log profile that it's shooting. It just kind of feels weird. You know, the fact that the highlights kind of clip early and your midtones kind of dip down low because you're trying to save your highlights, it makes it a little bit hard to shoot in some scenarios because it just isn't full of dynamic range like some other cameras are. But I think once you got used to it, if you could just figure out your way of shooting with it and your kind of workflow with it, you know, it was really not that big of a deal especially for the cost. All right, so that's really all I have to say about the Sigma FP right now, but maybe I'll readdress this in another video and we can talk a little bit more about it. And so until next time, guys, I'm Spencer Sakurai. See ya.